Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel with myself Richard and welcome to a new year. And what better way to start the new year than with a new fellow presenter? Let me introduce Neil Cody. Neil, welcome. Thank you very much, Richard. Neil is one of our uh, guest authors who has done a number of features for us now and is going to be doing some more videos. And most importantly, Neil has brought with him just a small part of an extensive watch collection. Neil, thank you for bringing these in. <laughs> You're welcome. We're going to cover them in detail. First of all, a quick wrist check. What are you wearing? I've got a Croton Nevada Grenchen um, watch I have. It's the Aviator Sea Diver from uh, roughly 1963. Wow. James Bond era. Beautiful. Yeah, I picked it up a few years back. One of my favorites. Wow, that's outstanding. My wrist check happens to be one of Neil's watches, which I may or may not give him back, which is a Breitling emergency, which I've always wanted. And we'll talk about that later too. So first things first, Neil, how did you get into watches? My background, I used, when I left school, I was a tool maker, a model maker. I've always been interested and had a passion for seeing how things work, taking them apart, putting them back together. And always had a watch from an early age, but nothing of any significance. Started off my, you know, with a Casio uh, calculator watch back in the 80s. It's kind of cool. It wasn't, <laughs> back in the day it wasn't. It's cool now. It's still cool. It, I, I, I'm, yeah. I am tempted to get one. What? That's so weird. I was looking at them on the internet just yeah. the other day because we were catching up on Stranger Things and it made me think, I want a Casio calculator. There's another video here. I bought here. it from WH Smith back in the day. I was 16. Casio anyway. calculators. Yeah. That's another video. Yeah. Onwards, sorry, we digress. Yeah, and then I had a Pebble watch when they first came mm -hmm. out, but didn't really kind of fall into it. I had a pop swatch. Remember the, oh, yeah, the pop yeah, swatches? Yeah. You pop them onto yeah, your jumpers. Yeah, yeah. Had one of those, but really didn't, my passion for watches didn't really start until much, much later in life, only four years ago. So. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And. That was triggered what because you just couldn't I hold saw, back anymore. You just yeah, I, I I guess I got to a part of my life is you know have a bit more spare cash and wanting to kind of mark things in my life that I perhaps hadn't done mm. or had had the funds to do so. And what was the first one? The one you were in it there. Wow, the Brightling, the yeah. one that you told me not to say on camera is thirteen thousand pound new. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think actually to be fair, that. I think they were only about five. The new, the yeah. new ones are they around are that. But yeah, but I now. think when they come out, oh. they're about four or five. Well, I've got but... to say, I mean, the Brightling Emergency is an icon, and yeah. if for that to be your first watch, um, I saw it in a GQ magazine I many years before, and I think it's one of those things. You know, you're thumbing through magazines, and at some stage, I've come back to mm. it saying, I remember that. And I'm now in a position to be able to get one. Wow. Well, I'm thoroughly enjoying wearing it. So advertising works. <laughs> Absolutely. It does, doesn't it? So looking at your collection that you certainly brought in today, there is a distinctly vintage lean. Yep. A sea of beautiful patinas here. Why have you focused very much on the vintage rather than brand new? Well, I've only ever bought one brand new watch. Uh, Just of all the one. watches I yeah. I I don't actually I'm not drawn to new watches. I like a watch that's got a a past. Wow, okay. You know, we when I buy a watch, I don't want it to look like it's been sitting in a safe for 30, 40 years. I want it to have had a bit of history. Mm. You know, it's got someone else's kind of DNA in that watch. Yeah. I want to be part of that watch's history for as long as I own it, whether I sell it or whether I pass mm. it on. Someone else takes that the baton and mm. runs with it for as long as they want to. This, 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 this leads into a really interesting feature that, about being a custodian of yeah. a watch. It was a fascinating concept, that. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we're on this planet for a very short amount of time. And, yeah. you know, when you have a watch, it doesn't matter what, what watch it is. The fact is you're, you're part of that watch's history. So, yeah. you, you know, you might have it for a year. You might have it for 50 years. It's going to outlast us. We're then going to pass it on to another collector or family friend, mm. whether they keep it, they might not want watches, they might just sell it, but someone else will take that watch and hopefully keep it for another. Yeah, time. I think this is really important because <clears throat> when we were looking at the watches earlier, some of the ones I did today, and I've got that Eterna uh, Sontani yeah. Economita there. Yeah. That was my wife's grandfather's. He survived two wars and treated himself in the, the late 50s, early 60s for sure. the watch. He was an engineer like yourself and he, we know he wanted a certified chronometer, yep. but wanted something a bit different. And we can only imagine the amount of research he as a character would have put into that watch because we've got enough information about the man to know what, what his character was like. Yeah. 
we know he liked watches. And I, obviously, I never met the man, but I can't help but feel he would be thrilled to know that four years ago, unbeknownst to me that it existed, my wife had it serviced and gifted me the watch. Yeah. And now I try and wear it once but that's it makes it it's important because you're carrying that on yeah. for as long as you've got it and, you know, pass it on to well, your... Well, as we were saying earlier yeah. off camera, it's the only watch in my collection that my son really says, I want that. Yeah. And he'll wear it then. And I think there because is Because of where it's, it's come from, it's that kind of lineage of yeah. it coming through the family and, you it's, know... It's beautiful. Yeah. And I think as you were alluding to earlier, it's not just the within the family as such. If your, your docs a dive watch there that we're going to talk about, I mean, it... I mean, I don't mean this in the, they're taken the wrong way. It's seen some service. It's battered. That's yeah, the, okay. The battered, the better. I, I, you was, know, I, I was being <laughs> polite. <laughs> I, when I look at a watch, I don't want something that's been kept in a safe. I want something Absolutely. that's got... I want to add to the, the marks on it. You know, if I'm not precious about... Mm. You know, you buy a brand new watch, the first time you clunk it on a sink or a tap, you know, it hurts. You keep doing that and mm. you develop in its own kind mm. of look. Not you do it on purpose, yeah. but, you know... We've got a great interview with Yup, who's the CEO of Fortis, right, um, on the YouTube channel at the moment, which people can can look into. And uh, he actually says on that video, "We love scratches." Yeah, yeah. They add to, they, for me. They they add to. I'll, I'm not drawn to new watches. They don't yeah. really do anything. I'd rather buy a watch that's got something already living through it. I, I that's it's a wonderful adage. I love it. Yeah. Uh, just to touch, go back backtrack a tiny bit. What is the one watch you bought new? It was a Yema, bronze Yema Superman. Um, and I bought that about four years ago from Kickstarter. And did you buy it new because you... I hadn't had a bronze watch. I had. I owned, I owned. still own a couple of Yemas, Yema Superman watches. Uh, they released it. It was kind of a deal on <clears> Kickstarter. <throat> and I wanted a... Yeah, I just, it, it fitted well in my collection, yeah. but it's now patinaed really well. Yeah, I love it. it's called green and. I went to look at a secondhand bronze black yeah. bay, and I didn't buy it because it was patinaed so well. Yeah, <clears throat> and although you, there's there's a very valid argument, you could say I wanted to be part of the journey of that watch. Yeah, uh, I would love a bronze watch to wear with me, uh, wear yeah. in time. Over absolutely, with me, like a, yeah, like a leather strap. Yeah, absolutely. You want it to wear, mm. be part of you. Yeah. So right, the collection of watches here. Uh, you're wearing the Nevada at the moment. Yep. Can you tell us a little bit about the Nevada Grenchen that you're wearing at the moment? So, yeah, I picked this up. This is a, a Chronograph Aviator Sea Diver. Uh, this is an early one. I think it's 1963, something like mm -hmm. that. So most of my collection is generally 60s to 80s, 90s. Okay. Late 90s would probably be the right. latest kind of yeah. one. What, what genre did that watch fit into? Because it's... Uh, I can't make up... Is, is it aviation? Is well, it this is it. I, it kind of crosses Explorer? over because... You know, it says it's a, a diver, but it's right. a chronograph. Yeah. So I guess yeah. perhaps when they were making it, they were trying to make it fit with everyone. It's an aviator sea diver. So, you, which, which to me then would put it into like a militaristic bracket. 100%. Naval yeah. aviation, something like that. It would have definitely been around that. Yeah, because yeah. we've, we've just reviewed the new Nevada Grinch in Antarctic. That's a great looking one. And it, it, it was stunning. Yeah. It, it, was, it was hard to part with it, I yeah. won't lie. But it's doing well on, on the YouTube channel, which just shows the brand is very, very popular. We've got yep. wonderful comments going back on it. The next watch that I can't help but notice because it's slap bang on my wrist here is your Breitling Emergency. Yeah. I cannot begin to tell you at this moment how hard it is to resist unscrewing Don't this crown and pulling it out. Don't do it. It's one of those things that you just, it'd be like getting into a Formula One car. Don't push the start button. And, and not being able to drive it. <laughs> it's so frustrating knowing that there's this incredible technology in this watch and I can't use it. Well, you could, but you'd have to pay for it. But it'd be worth leaving the camera running just to see and how long timer. it takes the helicopter to arrive. <laughs> Joking aside, did you hear about the guy on the motorway that did this? I did not. He bought one. He was stuck on a traffic jam on the M25. Sheer boredom, unscrewed it, pulled it out. Oh. The first thing he knew about it was when there was a yellow Sea King above him. There you go. And he had to pay all the costs for the yeah. Sea King. Yeah. So, I mean, joking aside, this is an outstanding watch. I mean, this is... We did a, um, a feature a long while ago on uh, desert island watches. Right. And it was, what watch would you have if you were on a desert island? And everybody was picking, oh, Hamilton Khaki Field Mechanical or uh, uh, Citizen Ray Mears. Yep. And then somebody said, hang on a minute, <laughs> wouldn't you just have the Breitling? And then you wouldn't be stuck on the damned island. As long as the battery doesn't run out. So for anybody who doesn't, <laughs> yeah, good point, well made. So 
For anybody who doesn't know what this incredible creation does, what does it do? It's got a multitude of functions on it. It's got uh, two time zones on it. It's got a chronograph. It's got an alarm on it. Um, tells the time, date, calendar, all that kind of stuff. But the, the secret behind it is obviously for those adventurers who might be stuck in a position where they actually do need some rescuing. I've not yet been in a position I need it. No. And I certainly wouldn't do it on the M25. So what does it do? I mean, what... So the idea is you. there's two uh, antennas. The idea is you unscrew the antennas, you pull them out, and that... And it, it's like an aerial. It's a very like thin a wire. copper wire, um, and that pulling it out activates a beacon, um, which is, I think it's got the frequency on there. Is it 144 or something? 121.5 megahertz. There you go. So that's the distress beacon. Yeah. That will be. This is probably mo constantly monitored, and will be picked up by some kind of emergency services, yeah. and they would react to it. I, I think, if, if I remember reading rightly, it was aircraft. Yeah, aircraft it is continually aircraft. have are monitoring that. Yeah, and I they think would something the flying over is about three hundred miles. Yeah, how long? Do you know how long it transmits for? No, no, I, I seem to remember it wasn't a particular. No, I don't long think it, it's time. probably like a ninety minutes or, or not, yeah. maybe a bit longer, but. I mean, there are some great stories around this watch where people have, gen you know, single-handed yachts. Yeah, people absolutely. Have genuinely yeah. had to use it. They've yeah. been washed over, over the deck. Yeah. Nothing but a life raft, and thought, oh, I've got my Breitling emergency Just on. Just don't get it wet. <laughs> it's a bit of a gaff on that one. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to 30 jump. minutes, 30 meters of water. Yeah, okay. We'll, anyway. we'll, gloss, we'll gloss over that. <laughs> uh, great watch. Love it. And you have to sign a document, don't you, to say yeah, you won't Yeah, I registered with Breitling. I had to sign that if I did pull the... Um, You're on your own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next one is the Tudor Sub. We have to talk about the Tudor Sub because yeah. we, <laughs> brackets I, think that this is way cooler than a vintage Rolex Submariner. Yep. Yeah. Definitely. I was drawn for quite a few years looking for a watch that did it all for me. The 7928, which that's the 7016, which kind of follows the 792. That's the, one of the last models uh, they transitioned to the new dial, but it, uh, it, it's in effect a 7928. Does it all for me? You know, it's, it's still got all the Tudor heritage and everything mm. else about it, but I just love the look of it. it yeah. It's patina. It, it's a great looking watch and I love, it makes me smile every time I wear it. Well, it has got the smiley dial. It has. Interestingly enough, I was in uh, my local watch shop recently um, looking at a series of 1950s and 60s Submariners. Yeah. And the, the gentleman that owns the shop was saying to me that people are looking at them and saying, yes, gosh, they're beautiful. And yes, they are slightly alarmingly priced because they range from about 10,000 up. But he said, people are coming in saying, have you got the Tudor sub? as well or can you get it i think there's more people interested in the, the older tudors than the older rolexes mm. for me i'm i do like Ro Ro rolexes i'm not I'm a huge fan of them i don't know why i was drawn to the you know the early tudors but yeah. i you know i think there's a massive following for the for the early tudors we, we did an interview quite recently with andrew from watchfinder he, he told me an interesting fact which i wasn't particularly aware of in that there was a point when when they introduced tudor mm -hmm. Um, they were the slightly cheaper alternative That's to right. Rolex. Yeah. But there was a period in the 60s and 70s where it went the other way, where the Tudors were better built, yeah. more robust. And if you can get them from that era, then they're really a prize worth having. I can see on your tag, it's 1970, this one. Yeah. So you're probably falling into that bracket where it is. it might have been better built than the Rolex. More than likely, yeah. But what I'm interested in at the moment is why... Maybe just from your perspective as another watch enthusiast, why the brand has this huge resonance just now, why it has this resurgence. I, th I think, you know, if you're looking for certainly a lot of Rolexes, the prices are so expensive. Mm. You know, I, I don't own a Rolex. I, maybe I'll get one at some stage. I'm, I'm not sure. But that's so interesting. So it's not a priority for you? No, no. Okay, interesting. I, I, I like Rolexes, but I, I, I've not. it's not a brand I've actually fallen for. My mm -hmm. brother-in-law collects Rolexes. And he's got some great pieces, but I fell for that watch. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's partly to do with its age. I was looking for a birth date watch as well. It's kind of close to my birth year. And I, I think there's more people interested in something you can actually get. A lot of the Rolexes, obviously, yeah. the prices are so inflated. And, you know, or certainly for the new ones, they're really, really hard to come by. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, next, I've got, I've made a note of is the Speedy, the Speedmaster. Yep. Now, <clears throat> we've got a couple of Speedies here that we use regularly for photography. We've got, 
Uh, both of them are moon watches. Yep. Um, one is one of the Hesslite crystal ones, which is the real moon watch. Yep. The other one's one of the ones with sapphire back and front, which is a very nice watch, but it's not a moon watch. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, yours is a much more unusual model. Yeah, this is the Mark 40 from about 1996. If you're into watches, most a lot of people have collect watches have got a Speedmaster mm. somewhere in there or have owned one. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I did want to get one, and this is the one that I was drawn to. It, it kind of does everything I want a watch to do, tells the time. It's got all the calendar functions, everything I need it for. I just like what go on the dials. Busy enough to be able to see what you know without too overcomplicated. It is instantly recognisable as a speedmaster, yeah. but it yeah. is so fundamentally different yeah. to what most people's idea of a speedmaster is. Yeah. Even the the Ed Whites and the the the, the Wally Shearers, and the, they're, although they're all subtly different, that is a very unusual configuration with the yeah. dial at the top and bottom and to the left. Yeah, it's got the aviation marker the airplane marker on the end of the yeah one of the chrono hands it's a bit i don't know it's, to me it's channeling a bit more of a it's almost it, it reminds me of and I, and I mean this in a complimentary the fortis b42 yeah the cosmonaut watch it's got it's got a that kind of look that. about it yeah, yeah yeah right the next one i want to talk about is the only digital watch on the table it's yep. the gerard perigo casquette now, we've just done my top five digital watches. This wasn't in it? In, in the magazine. <laughs> no, I, it you wasn't. Missed it. You missed it, it wasn't in it because I didn't know it existed at that there point. There you go. I mean, it's it's fabulous it's to look the only, down. It's the only gold watch I own. It's gold-plated, but I've had probably about six months. The plating's all come off. Again, it's all battered, but to me, that just adds to the story. This is owned by a guy in New Zealand um, who bought it from you and wow. has kind of worn it through his whole life. And now his, his son sold it on. You know, they made them in stainless steel, macrolon and the, the gold. I've never really been a fan of gold watches because they're a bit kind of blingy. Mm. But I thought it'd be fun to... Uh, and I'll, every time yeah. I've worn it to different events, everyone, what is that? Because yeah. I may not have heard of the brand, but, you know, it's a bit sparkly. And <clears throat> What I loved about it when I looked at it was the fact that it reminded me so much of the very first Texas Instrument pocket yep. calculators. Yeah, yeah, remember that. Because this is predating LCD, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, this yeah, is, yeah, yeah, this would be it, LED. I mean, th there will it? be a close-up over our voices, so obviously here, where it's the red numerals that yeah. pop up. I mean, what was the battery life like on it? Because you have to obviously activate it every time you do. To I look mean, at it. I think the batteries last quite a while because obviously yeah. you you know you press it, it literally comes on for two or three seconds yeah. and it's off. So your battery life is actually going to be pretty good on it. It, it. Again, it's a very very it's a driver's watch. So the way it's angled is that when you're wearing it, you don't you know like a normal watch, you have to yeah. rotate your wrist to yeah. watch it. This as you're wearing, you just. All right, you have to press and take, <laughs> take your hand, hand off, off the, the steering wheel. wheel. <laughs> <laughs> this I'll ask your wife, can you just press that this button? This could explain why a number of Formula One cars crashed in the there 70s. You go. But it's a very, very uh, different yeah. looking watch and I'm chuffed to bits with it. Yeah. I mean, can, can I be rude and ask? Because I, I can pretty much guess on the others. I have not got a clue what you would pay for that. Would you mind no. telling what you uh, paid for I've paid, I think I paid about 1,500 quid for it. Right, Okay. So they I wonder what it was new. I I think they were about eight hundred dollars. The that guy would, paid for it. Well, nineteen seventy six. You yeah, got here. Yeah, that was quite a lot of money, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how what it would equate to, but yeah, yeah. it would have been a lot of money. Well, it's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I mean, so it's, it's again, it's got a big scratch across the top of it. <clears throat> I don't think I did that, but it, yeah, it's a great piece. I, I won't won't get it replated it'll be yeah. left exactly as it is and stay in my collection for quite some time we all need i think now a vintage digital watch in our lives it brings you every time you wear it, it just brings you back yeah. to when i was a kid and you know your calculators and all that kind yeah. of stuff the last one i picked out because we haven't got time to cover them all yeah. unfortunately is the doxa the shark hunter so this is uh shark hunter again same kind of era and this would be 1970 um, this is the Sub 300 Shark Hunter, but this is the Aqualung version, which I believe was Jacques Cousteau started, a, was working with Doxa at the time, and he okay. kind of went off on his own and branded a lot of sh um, his own brand for Aqualung. Right, so, okay, so that's got some pretty good links. Yeah, and this is the earlier one that's got the Synchron, because uh, 
docks are, uh, when they're for their early models, uh, they had synchron movements in them. Um, and this is this is an early synchron version. So not many of these still around today. It's a bit of a beast and it's well battered, but um, I love it to bits. Yeah, it's it's a great looking watch. We've just recently kind of forged a relationship with Doxa and I had the um, sub 300T carbon through. Great piece. So which light. Is, it's stunning yeah. with that patterning and swirling on the case. Yeah. But without that, none of the current 300 no. iterations would have existed. No, no. I think the Jacques Cousteau heritage is fascinating because, again, we were just talking briefly off camera about the IWC Aquatimer. Yep. It's got bits of the Calypso deck in the back. Yeah. You're not a diver, though. No, I'm not a particularly good swimmer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I, I've got a thing for dive watches. I'm not sure why, but... Um... I think it's because... Well, yeah, it's a good point. Maybe this is another discussion. It's, I think it's because it's about having that... It's something that's hugely reliable. And whether you choose to use it as an outdoor watch or a field watch, you're having something that you can rely on. Because if it can withstand that environment, then you're... Let's be honest. A lot of people collect watches if they collect divers' watches. How, <clears> what percentage dive with them? Five percent, one percent. Well, if that uh, Rafael Granito, the CEO of Formex, when I was reviewing his reef, said that he reckoned ninety nine point nine percent of dive there watches go. never go in water. Yeah, their desk, they sit on a desk. Go, people go yeah. to work, but it just proves that they're built to withstand. Yeah, you know, if you clock it, drop it, it doesn't really make any difference. The fact is, you know, it's going to yeah. be okay. And it, in in <clears throat> in today's world, I think without trying to say it, over romanticize it. Um, to have something that is built to that standard mm. that is relatively affordable yeah. is a, still a beautiful thing to own. Yeah. Thank you very much for bringing them in. You're warm, this welcome. has been great to intro you. Um, it's been a pleasure. Neil will be back. I will we'll be, be back. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much as always for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and go over to the Watch Gecko magazine if you want to do some more reading.